So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, um, Leon Ravenna. Leon is currently the Chief um, Information Security Officer of a 2.5 billion multi-nation company in the auto auction and the financial services space, providing security, privacy, compliance expertise for over 15,000 employees. Leon has led nat nationwide support, VAB and CRM development efforts, data center bills, heavy infrastructure for SAES companies in the medical and the financial space. Leon has extensive ex experience in um, regular, regulatory compliance and privacy, having managed ISO 27001, HIPPA, SSAE-16, PCI, and NIST system bills and audits. In addition to holding a PMP, Leon holds a CISSP and is one of a very small group worldwide to hold six major global privacy certifications, including CIPM, CIPPC, CIPPE, CIPPG, CIPPUS, and FIP. So with further, uh, we, without further ado, let's welcome Leon. Thank you. Hey guys, how you doing today? Hopefully, uh, hopefully good, hopefully you're safe. Uh, hopefully you're sane. Um, I can't guarantee the sane part, being that uh, you're probably all working out of the house. And uh, so what um, what I'd like to do today is kind of walk through some regulatory stuff. This is typically not the 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 most fun part of of what you're going to do as a uh, as a um, a security professional going forward. However. Everything that I'm going to talk to you about today is going to be paramount uh, going forward. The the amount of regulatory pieces are are growing, and as you look at, uh, I mean, even going through all this this COVID stuff, the the arguments they're having at a federal and a state level on on who's in charge of what and how, um, it will it will come to uh, it will come to to bite people at some point if they don't. They don't prepare for it, and the more that you prepare for it, looking at your future careers, the better. So with that, I'm going to get started and uh, see if we can't get this thing rolling. So hopefully a few takeaways that I will leave you with. Um, understanding implications of laws uh, in place and coming up, um, how to comply with them, how to understand, you know, so your contracts, data flows are going to be impacted. Uh, some ways to help you drive implementation and quite frankly for the organizations that you will end up working for the, the ability to make things a competitive advantage using security and privacy so working towards driving security and privacy up to the front of the line not necessarily the back of the line uh, in the way that contracts typically get done is they get through all of the the happy stuff up front where they're buying uh what the price is and then at the very very end it'll be hey you security guys sign off on this and what what i'm trying to do for my company and for other companies is help move security up to the front of the line so essentially being at the table for all of the the, the individual negotiations and then quite frankly there's some uh some personal professional benefits that will be there so what I'll do is first give you a little bit about CAR because most people don't know who we are. Um, some quick facts and figures. But first, we are uh, we, our job is to power the world's most trusted automotive marketplaces. And we do this through innovation, technology, and people. Uh, we are based in Carmel, Indiana. Uh, I take care for about 15,000 people uh, in the US, Mexico, Canada, um, UK, and Brussels. And, uh, and we sell cars for a living. We typically off-lease vehicles. We do a lot of it. And as you can see, we are uh, in really about 75 countries by the time you get through every place that a vehicle can be bought. Uh, multiple locations, uh, about three and a half million vehicles sold. About half of those are sold online. And uh, we write all of our own software. So we either write it or we buy companies that are writing the software. So. With that, let's get on to uh, some interesting stuff. 
So it doesn't seem odd. You know, people will give their personal data away. You know, I, I really want that flashlight app. And when that flashlight comes up on my phone, it says, hey, I need access to all your contacts. Uh, they don't, but if you will give it to them, it's great. Um, people will tell their innermost secrets to all their friends and so on and so on. People take pictures all over the place and post them online. You know, in fact, uh, I read the, the privacy notes for Facebook several years ago, and it basically said they own those. So your pictures, but Facebook owned them. In, in the world where we're at right now and moving forward, privacy is going to be huge. Okay, um, it's one thing for for you to give up your personal privacy for something. It's another thing for a company to take it away. So that's where the the big divide is. So we'll we'll start a little bit with you know where and what to be worried about. Today we're going to focus on the green parts here. So GDPR, CCPA. Um, there's some existing laws in the U.S. today that are are in place. Uh, for people in school, you would have heard about FERPA, uh, HIPAA and Healthcare, COPPA for Kids. There's some laws in Canada called PEPITA that covers all of Canada. And then there's some interesting stuff happening in Russia and China. Basically, one of the interesting things in Russia is if you create data there, you will automatically give a copy of that data to Russia. So, you know, maybe instead of them historically taking it, you're going to give it to them. So, um, this is the areas to be concerned with. We will see there's new laws in Brazil. There's new laws popping up all over the world. And uh, so you can expect this wherever you end up working, you will start to see some of these laws. So, first, probably good to differentiate. Uh, typically, I think about security as locking the door, so nobody can get in. When I think about privacy, it's more about closing the shade, so you know people can't look in the windows. And uh, these two together help provide the overall security blanket for uh, for the organizations you will end up working for. So, the the way that we we look at laws today. Um, there's laws in the rest of the world. There are existing laws uh, in the U.S. And the U.S. is mostly a patchwork of laws. So there's laws that are sectoral around like education, around healthcare, but nothing that is overriding. Uh, CCPA, which we'll talk about, is will be the, the toughest in the U.S. And then NYDFS, this is uh, Department of Financial Services in New York, covers security controls for banks, insurance companies. So very particular to the, you know, the Wall Street space, but it, we have a company there that is a small insurance company. And so we're covered by NYDFS. And then GDPR is the, the toughest privacy regs in the world right now. And uh, my guess is you've heard about some of it and I'll cover a little bit, but just to give you kind of a, a flavor of some of it. At the end of the day, what we care about from a privacy standpoint, really from a security standpoint, but from a privacy standpoint, what is the data? Okay, what data are we trying to, to take care for? In Europe, when they look at GDPR, it is uh, two categories of data. So it's things like name, location, uh, basically it's personal data, but it's not in-depth personal data. There's a second set of sensitive data that covers race, opinions. Uh, it even goes into trade union membership. So in Germany, everybody belongs to a trade union, and this is sensitive data. Anything genetic um, or biometric will be considered sensitive data, and you have to manage those things a little bit more stringently than you do personal data. And then CCPA in California will add more things. So what you start to see with more of these laws is that you start to include things like uh, IP. You start to include things like email address. So, you know, I have five different email addresses, but I could be offended if somebody gave up 
one of those uh, email addresses. And we'll talk a little bit about a, a lawsuit in, uh, in Europe on this particular point a little later. And then there's the things you would normally expect to see that are sensitive. Social Security, driver's license, things like that are covered as well, but they're typically covered in, um, in Congress with something else uh, that tied to your name, okay? And, uh, but when, when we're looking at all of this, the most important question that you'll ever ask is what is the data that I'm concerned about for this particular thing that we're trying to secure or what are we trying to make sure is private? It'll always go back to the base question of what is the data? And so anytime we're looking at a system, we look and say, okay, what data are we trying to protect? In, in what way, in which way we secure it, things like that. So uh, one of the things that's important to understand is that in Europe, uh, data privacy has been a human right, not just a right, but a human right since 1947. And in May of 18 was when they had the, when GDPR rolled in and it wasn't exactly like this, but probably pretty close. Um, May of 18, you probably got about a dozen or more things on your apps that said, hey, accept my privacy policy. Well, that's one of the things that, that came up in GDPR. And so there was a whole bunch of people getting probably annoyed at, at, what, they, uh, at what they were seeing. Now, the, if you harm people, so to speak, from a GDPR standpoint, the EU will level fines. Today, if you look at the fines, things with HIPAA, probably in the, the low single digit millions, um, EU in general sued Google a few years ago for $2.7 billion, that's billion with a B, and they're probably still arguing about that, um, there was two issues recently. Marriott had a an issue with a company they bought in 2014 called Starwood Brands. They had a uh, essentially a PCI breach, and Marriott was fined for not doing good enough due diligence on their acquisition. And then British Airways had a breach a little bit ago, um, and they were fined $230 million. Now, both of those are are being argued right now, but fines in Europe can be up to 4% of global revenue. So that's worldwide revenue, no matter if you have one person in the EU or your whole company's based there. And then recently, the uh, Federal Trade Commission fined Facebook $5 billion. This was around um, an issue with data in the 2016 election with Cambridge Analytica. And I would presume that when, when CCPA goes into full swing in uh, July of this year, that Facebook will have another fine because California is gonna want their money too. So anyway, if we, if we look at just a couple of the, the highlights of GDPR and CCPA, um, we'll get to Things like it's the biggest privacy legislation ever. One of the things that is the most important around GDPR is getting consent. In the US, when you sign up for something, typically you see a checkbox that is already checked for you. What that is is considered opt out. So I, as somebody in the US, have to opt out of somebody doing something. So if you go back to that same example, with your with the flashlight app you know you will have a thing that says hey we've automatically checked all the boxes for you you don't have to do any work well in the eu it's just the opposite the individual has to make an, an understanding and informed consent that you will get their data okay uh, they have the ability to opt out of a transaction now there are some things where they can't so like, for instance, if somebody has consented to give us their data and they buy a vehicle, well, you can't really opt out because we still have to collect from you. But, so there are things where it doesn't work, 
but they do have the ability to opt out of transactions and there's shared liability. So when I say controller and processor, this may be, you know, for instance, if uh, we're selling vehicles on behalf of Fiat in, uh, in London, um, they would be considered the controller and I'm doing work on their behalf and I can only do exactly what they tell me. Anything that is outside of that, I can't do. And then there is a strict breach notification. And this even includes if you inadvertently delete data. Okay? Um, the, the notice here is 72 hours. So 72 hours from the time that you find out about a breach until you have to report it. And in the case where, again, I'm selling cars for Fiat, um, the controller has to tell who's called the ICO in Europe, the Information Commissioner's Office, that there was a breach. So they have 72 hours. So I typically have 24 to 48. Once you find out about something, you'll let them know. And there's been real confusion in Europe so far on what actually constitute a breach. So if somebody lost a laptop, they may be declaring a breach. If somebody like Marriott or British Airways, you know, that's the classic breach. So there's still some still some uh, issues around what you actually have to report and how. Um, there are more technical controls. So technical controls think security controls. Um, they they have a function called pseudonymization, and I've read this thing 25 times. Can't figure out exactly why you would do it because it's not as good as encrypting data. So everybody is essentially encrypting data. And they threw some things in that are interesting. So you have to have a proven mechanism for being able to restore data. You know, inevitably, people are very good at backing up. They push the button, tape spin, they write it to disk, and that's all good. They never restore it. So in order to avoid the, hey, I deleted data by accident, you have to be able to prove you can get it back. And then um, ultimately, companies will have to certify, but there is no mechanism today to certify. So one of the things that we've done the last two years is uh, we've had a third party come in and validate what we are doing from a uh, from a GDPR standpoint to show exactly what we're doing. So let's move on quickly. Um, the The data transfer piece is probably the biggest in in this case, and this is exactly how. Uh, Europe looks at it, they look at us, the U.S., as, as not adequate or not worthy. And in this case, well, it's in most cases, but in this case, it is for the the laws that we have governing data transfer. And in in almost all cases, you want to make sure that data stays within the European Union or the EA, which is uh, the EU plus three. And uh, so what we do is we maintain what's called data sovereignty. So we make sure that data that is um, of European individuals stays in Europe so it never comes to the US. The, the only way that you can legitimately and legally transfer data outside of the EEA is gonna be with something called Privacy Shield that is done through the, uh, the US government and so it's just a set of standards that you have to adhere to and that you have to attest to how you're doing it. But that is the only way that you can legitimately move data outside of the EU. And then there's a couple things here that, that aren't as, as big a deal um, on moving data. There's some ways you can get out of it. Um, and these things are either very, very expensive um, or the derogations, it's like, here's what my excuse is or uh, for not doing it right, and that, that's never gonna work. And then one of the things that is critically important is understanding who my vendors are and where that data goes to. What are they doing with the data? So I may sell cars for Fiat, but then I may have a third party supplier and I have to manage what they're doing as well. So you can start to see how some of the supply chain pieces fit in with each other and, and quite frankly, what you have to know about your downstream suppliers 
starts to get very interesting. So if you take this back to, you know, at the base, we're trying to work on security things. We're trying to work on privacy that are somewhat integrated. You have to start understanding how your vendors are working. So it actually ties you more closely to the business. There's some things that you will have to know, um, things like right to be forgotten. You have the ability in Europe to say, I don't want you to know about me anymore. Now, again, this works fine for marketing type information. Um, it doesn't work for I've, I've bought something and I have a financial transaction or, or obligation to a company, then you can't be forgotten. But there are things that, um, that you can forget. And in, there's been many cases where people have asked us, hey, I don't want you to send me emails anymore. I don't want you to, you know, want you to call me. We can take care for all those things pretty easily. And then we talked a little bit about the, uh, the breach notification. The one, the one kind of silver lining here is, and this is the incentive, if your data is encrypted, you don't have to tell people if you had a breach because theoretically it shouldn't be readable, okay? But what GDPR doesn't do is they don't stipulate particular types of encryption. They just stipulate that it has to be encrypted. So you could get away with uh, with a lower strength encryption, but it's not worth doing if you don't do it well. And then there are, we talked about subcontractors. There are special things that you have to have in place. So I have to have contracts in place with any vendor that touches data. This is something that you want to do and you normally want to do, but in this case, you have to do. So just a real quick lesson, um, on GDPR, what it is and what it does, and we'll get into some of the interesting things now. Um, there has been some recent stuff in the last few months. Uh, Google actually won something where they didn't have to get rid of, of data for someone, okay? Um, now, on the flip side, about the same time, Facebook was told they have to take out content globally. So you can see where different parts of the EU are doing different things. So the EU as one entity, um, Germany can bring suit or Belgium can bring suit on a particular piece. And then there was a, uh, a lawsuit recently, uh, Lloyd versus Google, where things like minimally exposed items, so an exposed email address, you could essentially have a class action lawsuit around that. So it's going to be, there, there's a lot of things happening in the EU space. Same thing will start to happen in California, where people who are very litigious will start suing about any number of things, and this will be part of it. Um, you have to show time to live. So um, typically on cookies, uh, cookies will live, can be a session cookie, but there are cookies, particularly YouTube, that will last 7,980 years, okay? Um, you're probably switching out laptops before then, but you know the, that cookie will last that long. And so you're gonna have to, to start showing that. And in the case where, where we do, we'll show it and it, it may make people mad or whatever, but we have to do it anyway. And then in the EU, there are 200,000 websites right now that are at issue because they use Google Analytics and talking about site performance data, things like that. Um, there's going to be big lawsuits about that, and I'll show you here in a little bit some of the things we're doing to uh, to combat that. Um, one of the interesting things is when you look at it from a compliance standpoint, right now there's only 9% of companies that are fully compliant. There's a, uh, the rest of them are somewhere in that. I think a lot of people waited to kind of see what would happen, you know, who would go first. Uh, maybe the big companies would, would get hit first. So like the, the Marriott's, the world, the, um, the British Airways, not my company. Well, for where we are today, we are in the fully compliant status. And uh, for one of our companies, and then a company we bought, we are probably right on the line for fully compliant. And uh, 
for what we know. But again, because there's no way to certify, there's no real way to say, yep, I have, I have a piece of paper that says I've done everything I'm supposed to. But it's telling that even in, in 19 when this was done, and this was only done six, seven months ago, finished, that most companies, you know, that's uh, is that 54%, 55% are not compliant at all. So there lots of people are going to get fined in, uh, in, at some point in time. So let's move out of Europe and move into the U.S. And we'll talk about California a little bit. Um, what's interesting about California is that all of the tech companies in California really want a, a uniform privacy law, but they don't want to go so far as GDPR has, because there's a lot of things that are just very onerous on companies to do. But there's a number of, of articles like this that are, are been coming out, and some of the key requirements for that it's really about 60 to 65 percent of GDPR. Uh, you do have a, a right to deletion. You have to essentially add two components to a website. So an individual can um, complain or object to you selling their personal data, if you do, and they have the right to know what data you hold on them individually. So if you don't sell data, you don't have to put a it's a seal or a mark on your website, okay? Um, and I'll show you how we're handling some of that here in a little bit. Um, the fines will end up being being high. So if you think about $7,500 per violation, what if you have a million records in your database and they're all in violation? Well, the numbers get pretty big pretty quick, okay? Um, there are larger sets of data that you have to worry about, and you have to know what data is sold so you can tell your downstream providers, hey, John Doe said I can't sell their data, so you can't sell it either. Now, the only, the only upside for a company is that individuals must request every 12 months, um, but in practice, as a company, if you delete somebody's information, you're not going to go back and, and recreate it. So um, these are the, the key requirements and that are kind of outside of what the, the GDPR pieces are. Now, from a one of the things that is very big within both GDPR and, and CCPA is data mapping, okay? So there's tools that are coming out to help with data mapping. But unfortunately, right now, it is mostly manual. So in, in this case, these are various companies that I take care for, vendors across the top, and then the red lines are, here's the data elements that are, uh, that are personal or sensitive, and then there's some data elements we send out that are you know, just vehicle information, so not a big deal. But what's important is that you have to understand the data flow. So what is internal, internal? What is internal to external, okay? Now, this is remarkably painful to do for every system that you have. And in fact, in, in my company, uh, CAR is a holding company and we take care for 17 separate lines of business that all talk to each other, okay? Now, we don't sell data, so it's easier for us to do but we have to map the data out and quite frankly, knowing what data moves where gives you a huge benefit on the security side. So if I know what data is moving where, you know, if, if I know that this vendor I'm sending data to, I'm only sending vehicle data that is no way, shape or form um, gonna harm me from a, a regulatory standpoint, do I have to secure that the same way where I may be sending uh, somebody's social security number. So some things that are critical to know that are very helpful um, on the security side as you, you know, as you get into this more, again, going back to what is the data that I care about? What is it traveling? Where is it traveling to? And quite frankly then, how do I break down how I'm protecting that data on a regular basis? 
So data mapping, while very, very painful, um, is critical to do. Now, there's some stuff that's coming out. This is brand new stuff. Um, enforcement on this starts in in July. The, the law went active at the beginning of the year. And even with uh, all of the coronavirus stuff, they're still on track to, uh, to launch this in seven, you know, essentially July. And then there are employer provisions that come into place the beginning of next year. There are some uh, new rules from the uh, California Attorney General um, that came out in October. And so it really didn't give people time to plan for them, but we're in process of doing that. Consent gets tougher. Um, one of the things that you'll hear about is do not track. Uh, this was popular several years ago and essentially telling you know a, a website, don't track what I'm doing. Uh, there are several browsers that will uh, that will help with this. Uh, Brave browser, uh, Firefox has a good one. and uh, and so you can do that. But being able to manage do not track, if you look at this, typically a, a website will say, yeah, we don't honor that, um, but now you may have to. And we're expecting the final rules coming from them here in, uh, in the next month or so. And we expect that you will see the next iteration of CCPA on the ballot in November um, getting even tougher than what they have right now. And you might say, well, you know, so I won't do business in California, except California by itself is the fifth largest economy in the world. So if you want to do business there, you will abide by these rules. And quite frankly, there's some things that doing a combination, and we'll talk about this in a bit, of GDPR and CCPA can give you a competitive advantage. But one of the things that's really starting to um, call it annoy or whatever, but that is around cookies. Um, cookies are actually, uh, quite frankly, a, a new cottage industry. Uh, it's amazing, and most in the US, it's not mandated yet, but in Europe, there's a number of things that are happening around cookies themselves that are spawning a new set of products to be able to, to deal with them. Uh, they're not mandatory yet, but 12 to 18 months, I guarantee they will be. And, you know, most people don't have a way to implement a cookie banner. Quite, um, quite frankly, the ability to do it in English, but then in 21 languages. So one of my sites in Brussels, I have to do it in 21 languages. And uh, it's as expensive to do from a, just from a translation standpoint, but hard to do in general and then getting in do not track um, things like can i do uh, implied consent understanding the different things that make up uh, cookies and so when i talk about that what i really mean is this cookie banner that you will see okay typically you'll have your text um, maybe what the settings are most most cookie banners in the u.s today basically say you know we use cookies thank you very much click yes to Continue. We do things a little different. So all of our cookies are turned off until there's a banner interaction. So you do something down here and then we give the, the user the ability to understand how their cookies are set and accept. And then ultimately um, we force interaction before somebody gets the site. So we're doing those things that, that you have to, to be in regulatory compliance, again, um, the the best way to, to deal with uh, getting fined is to not get fined in the first place. So um, this cookie settings piece is interesting. We actually built this piece that shows what cookies are in use very early in, uh, in 18 after GDPR went active. And uh, our outside counsel made me do this and uh, it's proven to be good because now it's it's coming into the forefront and we give people the ability to, they have control, okay? They can turn cookies on and off. So, you know, if you go to a site that deals with cookies, you can turn off targeting cookies and those will be turned off as long as you don't clear those um, forever. 
and then we give people the ability to come back and change them at will. And then uh, right here where it talks about the cookies used, we will add that time to live piece, which essentially can be from you know 10 seconds to 8,000 years. So you have the law in Europe, you have a law in California. What about the federal government? Well, from a federal standpoint, um, there are a number of senators and, and Congress people that want to establish a law. And Ron Wyden out of Oregon has been um, leading the charge. The real important piece here is they would like to add criminal penalties. So think about that. If you are if you are in the security or privacy space and you don't do something that the government thinks you should, they will want to potentially put you in jail, okay? Um, so it's, it's something to keep in mind. Um, part of my job is to make sure that the people that I work for and the board that I work for doesn't go to jail. So making sure that we are doing those things from a security and privacy standpoint that keep us out, out of headlines, okay? So some of the things that uh, we should expect to see, um, there will be the biggest issue of all will be private right of action. So does an individual have the ability to sue? And as you can, can probably imagine, most of the people on the, um, the Democrat side of, of, the, of Congress want the ability for an individual to sue most people on the Republican side don't. So this will be the probably the, the single biggest issue. And then the second one will be um, don't mess with existing laws like in California. Uh, Congress will eventually agree on something. The day they can't agree that the sun came up, but eventually they will. And so I wouldn't expect anything this year. I wouldn't expect anything next year maybe in uh, in 22. So about the time that you guys are out and working, they will have this. And when there is a US privacy law, it will be poorly, um, poorly written, uh, quickly implemented, and there will be lots of opportunity for jobs on this stuff. So it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, this will be something where people don't have a lot of expertise. And so having expertise in this space will Basically, I won't say guarantee, but it'll it'll ensure that uh, there are jobs available. And then there are some things where states will drive their own interpretation. Um, 800.53 is the, the FISMA standard, and uh, it incorporates privacy. And essentially, people will, uh, up until the time there is a federal law, uh, states will one-up each other. I'm expecting New York to kind of leapfrog what California is doing. So we're working to blend that. And before we get to that, we have a, you know, kind of the, the timeline that I expect. This is my speculation, so just personal. Um, we sit right about here, okay? Um, I built this actually about this time and I was right on Brexit, yay for me. Um, we'll see what actually happens in the year of Brexit. But I expect that federal will be out here but there's a number of things happening between now and probably 22 before that, that works. So the companies that you're gonna go work for, I talked a little bit earlier about, as you look at, at security and privacy, it's typically the last thing that's put in, as opposed to building it in from the beginning. If you turn that around and utilize security and privacy as driving factors, as competitive advantage tools. That's where we're, we're building, uh, particularly our stuff in Europe right now, to where I can go to a, a vehicle manufacturer and say, yeah, I do all the security stuff you want, let's talk about that instead of waiting until the very end, okay? So some of those things, if you look at it, um, my, uh, not speculation, but more the where I'm driving people, is let's look at this as a blended approach. I don't want to do anything, I, I can't as an organization do something separate in Europe and then separate in California and Illinois and New York and Florida. 
So we're trying to blend them. If you look, if you take, if you do this individually, your homepage is going to look like a ransom note with do not sell buttons and what data is held buttons and consent and cookie banners. Um, one of the things that I talked about a little bit earlier was Google. And if you look at, this is the banner from my main site. Um, we actually include right up front that we use Google Analytics and that we do not sell your data. Okay, so instead of building in a bunch of things that are going to look pretty ugly, we get it to you right at the beginning when you connect the first time. And this this helps us, A, make the site cleaner, but also gets it right up front so nobody can say, well, I, I wasn't told. Okay. Now, when I look at a blended approach, I'm looking at it saying, really, in three parts. Let's do the bulk of GDPR because that's going to help us with what California has to have. There will be some additional pieces that I toss in for California. And if I include the security controls that are within NYDFS around encryption, around multi-factor, things like that, if I do those three things together, chances are that whatever law comes up from whatever state or other country, I'm going to have the ability to adjust and not rebuild. So when you think about things from a code standpoint, the absolute most expensive time to do anything is after the fact. So let's build it in right at the beginning. And some of those things that we're looking at, you know, for instance, these are all the things, well, a subset of things that you want to do for GDPR. <clears throat> but if you're doing them for GDPR and you have a system in the US, you do the same diligence on that you're part way to having all the ccpa stuff done as well and so like you're going to do data mapping on both you're going to do privacy notices on both you'll add in links for the sites okay um there's ways to to take care for do not track uh, one of the tools that i use today is from a company called one trust and they will autom they actually build my banners but it will also help me with do not track um, I have the cookie banners and stuff like that optional in the US today. But if you're doing them for GDPR, I mean, you, you're 90% of the way anyway. And then when you add the, the security pieces, so you add in some of the encryption pieces. So, you know, you're automatically doing encryption at rest. Uh, you add things like key rotation. And if you're doing stuff in AWS, they will manage key rotation for you. Uh, most of the historic on-prem data centers, people were terrified of key rotation. Well, let Amazon manage that for you. Um, adding in multi-factor everywhere. Um, as a uh, as an aside, my uh, my daughter goes to Purdue, and and she was uh, all bent out of shape. I think it was Blackboard that um, required two-factor. And I said at some point. This will protect you, and now she's doing two-factor on everything. Um, anything that you're doing around PCR, taking credit cards, making sure that it's somebody else's problem. Um, in order to make a, a system uh, level one PCI compliant, it's around 350 controls you have to get audited against. Much better to outsource this to somebody else. Um, adding in things like web application firewalls in front of what you're doing, logging everything you do. So these are all the things that that you've learned over time, these are the right things to do, but quite frankly, most people don't end up doing. So building these things in give you the ability to um, use these ad com as competitive advantages, as opposed to you know, being the, the security guy that lives behind a door and they slip pizza under the, under the door every so often, okay? Um, so quick way to build this, uh, I guess I can't say quick, um, in five easy steps. Um, if you blend these, it will help you avoid fines and quite frankly, give you a competitive advantage. As example, one of the sites that we prepped for CCPA, we told them there's four things you have to do on your website to be quote unquote GDPR compliant. I said, if you do them now, you don't have to do them in the future. 
they did all four and they said wait i can take this and i can go sell this to my customers that's the point you're building in more security controls that are easy to manage and we're doing it up front so giving that to customers right up front um, secondly you will reduce cost the more that you can build security and privacy in early the less it's going to cost over time okay and things like having uh, this is much easier today with uh with aws azure gcp to be able to do automatic failover uh, between regions historically this was a holy hassle to do between um, multiple data centers um, getting things with scale okay having the ability to again adjust instead of rebuild is going to help you immensely okay and then uh, reducing your costs oh got that one twice that's because it's so important so on the personal side what does it mean okay as as you're going out looking for jobs you're trying to figure out you know i i want to be able to be good at a number of things so i am employable okay and one of the things i've done is taken the I used to do heavy infrastructure then i did security now i do security and privacy so it's making sure that i am making myself the most valuable that i can for my company it will only um from a job perspective there will be more opportunities for you um, on a personal level just understanding what your rights are you may be one of those people that wants to sue somebody that is uh impacting your rights um the new and existing security privacy positions Will be around for a long time um they're they're not going away and there will be new roles okay as a privacy engineer how do i build out cookies what am i looking for from protect people's data <clears throat> up to and including data protection officer with some of the the certs that uh that david had, had uh, rattled off i'm a data protection officer in europe just won't ever go there so it is good for you personally, professionally, um, to combine the security work you're doing with some of the privacy work. And with that, you don't have to listen to me more because I'm gonna go to Q&A, if there is any questions. And David, maybe you can help me with uh, questions here if I don't see them. Dave or Jerry, can you help me with questions there if there are any? Jerry, you're on mute. Who are you talking? There I am. I, I just reminded everyone they should unmute their mic if they had a question, just like okay. I forgot to do. That question besides the, you know, who's actually on the call um, are the, the two things I hear most often since I spend about uh, six hours a day on Zoom. <laughs> I'm going to unmute everybody's mics. So as soon as I do that, if you don't have a question, go ahead and mute yourself so we don't get feedback. Thanks. And one's on. Okay, mics are unmuted, so please, again, if you don't have a question, go ahead and mute yourself. That means I did a fabulous job at explaining stuff. Or, or lost everybody partway through. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did a great job, Leon. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, appreciate it. I come from a very different background over here. My name is Joe Plocha. I'm from uh, General Motors. I work on uh, embedded systems, but in the embedded systems, I'm working on network intrusion detection systems. And I confer quite frequently with our legal staff regarding PIA and PI. So saw this on uh, an advertisement within the company, decided to pop in, see what was going on. I'm also taking some CISSP classes, working towards that over the course of the 
Uh, my guess is it's going to be about another year <laughs> before I finish all that. So I appreciate yes. the class and the, the insight that you brought. They've covered some of the same the, topics. Uh, just know on the CISSP that everything that you study for is not what's on the test. <laughs> really? That's always nice. Well, I got a pretty good, well-rounded background. Yeah, you will you will go through and understand encryption cold, and uh, they won't ask you a question on it. So uh, it is what it is. I see. Yeah. So, but your mileage may vary. Objects in mirror may be larger than they appear. Yep, absolutely. Good guys, we're at about 522. Jerry said that it should go about 50 minutes. I think we're right on track. And uh, if there's no questions, I'll be happy to give give you guys back the rest of your day. No, well, thank you much. Hey, thanks, thanks all. Thanks, Leon. This is awesome. I really thank you, Leon. Really appreciate it.